Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this week's film is called Run, Lola Run in English. And uh, it's kind of fun to look back at this point in the semester and see where we've been to culturally. Argentina, France, Italy, the States, Japan, and then this week, Germany. I think if anybody came up to you on the street and said, we want you to invest in a film where we're going to show a woman running around a city in Germany, not a lot of people are funding that particular movie, but uh, they do a great job with this. It's a, it's a brilliant film, and, and here's some of the reasons why. Um, it's different, it's unusual, and uh, it's, it's a, an extremely well-crafted film. So first, the editing. Uh, one time, the film, when it first came out, had the most edits in it um, of any feature at its time. Um, music, the music plays a role in this film um, nearly as much as it did in Easy Rider. Um, and it's hard to imagine any other type of music that would work as well uh, for this story. Time is a big theme here. Uh, it's time within the movie. It's the narrative of uh, about time. It's manipulating time. Um, time is your main theme um, from start to finish in this thing. It also raises a philosophical question about free will uh, versus determinism. I know in this country we we are very much uh, believers in uh, a, a very strong free will that if we work hard and we go to college and and uh, we do certain things, we can change and make a better life for ourselves. Um, that's not the same belief around the world. And um, there's a good context link that covers this. Uh, it's only a couple of minutes, four or five minutes, and it explains the concept of free will versus determinism rather well. The story is a non-traditional narrative arc. Okay, it uses a traditional arc, but it's a non-traditional use of the arc. Now, in regards to time, uh, we need to talk about two terms here. One is linear time for a film, and that's how long it takes you to sit there and watch it. And the other is story time, and that's the manipulation of time within the film. And, and a good way to think about that is if you, let's say you watch a, a feature documentary on World War II. It takes 90 minutes or, or two hours to sit through the whole documentary. Well, the time that it covers, the story time for World War II in our case, is give or take a year or two, about four years. So it doesn't take four years to watch the documentary, right? So the linear time is, let's say, 90 minutes. And then the story time, the manipulation of time within the frame, is what the narrative is uh, trying to tell. And in that documentary example, it would be four or five years. Um, this film is all about manipulating time. And it's one of the reasons I still use this film of this class, because it's easy to see when it shifts and changes. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a perfect vehicle to have this discussion. So Roger Ebert is a, was a famous film uh, critic. And he points out a couple of things here. One, that film is ideal for showing alternate and parallel timelines. There's no doubt about that. And we see that very directly in this film. But, but the manipulation of time is, and especially through edits, takes place in every film that we watch. All right. The other thing to keep, uh, keep in mind here is something called the uh, butterfly effect. And this comes out of a, a sci-fi novel um, from the 50s, probably. And a guy gets sent back in time. He's told not to go off the path. He walks off the path and uh, unintentionally steps on a butterfly and kills it. When he returns back to his time, uh, the present, if you will, the, the whole universe and world has changed. 
change. And, and the implication here is that if you alter even one small thing, um, it has the potential to change uh, all future events. So when you start manipulating time here, and it's done uh, in literature and then directly in, in cinema, uh, this is a concept that will come up in almost any time traveling movie. So when we look at the traditional story arc, uh, let's just remember a few points here. Look at your bottom down here, and this is your time, and this is your linear time. So how long does it take us to watch Run, Little Run? The intensity should increase as the film moves along in linear time. Setup is where we meet our characters. Turning point, remember, shifts and gives the protagonist, if you will, a direction, a new direction usually. And then she overcomes obstacles to either succeed or fail at that climactic event. So if we look at this and run Lola Run, they, they even compress time in version two and three, but that's because you already know what the setup is and you'll see the turning point done in a much shorter fashion. And then you're gonna see her overcome different kinds of obstacles. But the climactic event is always the same. Does she save her boyfriend? Does she get the money there in time? And <clears throat> the intensity, is set up within the movie because there's a false storyline, which is she has 20 minutes to solve this problem with the money, okay? Now, why it's a tr non-traditional story arc is that what the director does is use uses this arc three different times. So we see the same characters, the same underlying theme, and the same motivation three different times with different outcomes each step of the way. So that's why it's non-traditional. It uses a traditional arc, but in a non-traditional way. So here's some things that I want you to look for in the film. What does the film say about love? Yes, we've seen a number of films that, that has love as a topic. This one is not as strong as Amelie was, um, it's more concerned about time, but it's still concerned about the relationship and her relationship with the boyfriend and her father drives a great deal of uh, the narrative. Then what does the film say about fate? And that goes back to the free will versus the predetermined life. And then how does showing different outcomes? So we have three mini movies in the feature and, and how to show showing different outcomes contribute to this discussion about love, fate, and time. Um, the sense of urgency, it, it's embedded in the narrative. It's everywhere. If you pay close attention, there's clocks everywhere. There's spirals everywhere. Uh, there's even um, um, uh, the roulette game that, when you see it from above, uh, looks like a, a, a clock. So time 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 cinematography cinematography is sophisticated the shots are uh, extremely well done um the the context link that i have for you in in um in the assignments area is uh there there is a documentary a short documentary on the making of this and they talk about the four camera guy that had to be suited up in a steady cam and then run backwards with all that gear for certain shots. Um, a heck of a job. Uh, but it's not for, they're not arbitrary. The, the, the shots, like the edits, are done to contribute to the story and the narrative. And then there's even a little bit of a use of animation. So, Quick cuts, you're going to see edits, dissolves, fades, wipes. Um, somebody apparently didn't have much to do on a weekend and sat there and counted them all. And that's where we get this number of 1,500, almost 1,600 edits in about the 80-minute feature. Um, keep in mind the, the difference between external rhythm and internal rhythm because that does now come into play with editing. So internal rhythm 
is uh, the blocking and the movement in time that takes place within the frame, within your shot. And then external rhythm is when the shot is cut and moves to the next shot. So external rhythm, internal rhythm, but sometimes, like music, will play together. Sometimes it will be dissonant intentionally to force tension. Watch how it's used in the film. Uh, and together, these things actually help create a, the sense of urgency that's wrapped around time. One quick uh, slide I'll show you here is this is how uh, they used to edit film. And this device here is called a moviola. And uh, there's little spools of film here and here. And then these spools would have uh, contained the audio track. So two separate uh, mediums here. And they run through, they're threaded through up in here. And in here is a razor blade. So when the editor got to a particular point where he or she wanted to make a cut, they would stop this. They would literally cut with the razor blade a piece of film, a piece of celluloid, and then pull it out until it got to the point where they wanted to edit to, move it through the moviola that they're watching here. And then they would physically splice that together with some what looked like uh, scotch tape. Okay. It's controlled, the action of uh, the spools is driven by a foot pedal, like uh, a sewing machine would be. And you can only imagine how time-consuming that would be. As if you remember, there's 24 frames in just one second of film. Um, so there's thousands and thousands of frames here. And keeping track of them and making these edits um, took a certain kind of individual with a lot of patience and a great deal of organizational skills, but also understanding the rhythm that was taking place within the frame and when the cut should be made. And that's, that's the art form of editing. Um, our actress is phenomenal. And one of the ways that we can tell is she's put in the same scenario that starts essentially the same way three different times. And now she has to retain certain parts of her character, but also change based on the different events that are gonna change within the narrative. She does this, this spectacular job. The sound, this is about music, music, music. Music sets up the scenes, the sound effects are heartbeats. It's all about this rhythm, rhythm, rhythm. And that has to do with time, time, time. So with that, um, have a good week. Um, and I will see you uh, a week from tonight then. Cheers.